It is always exciting for an old teacher like me to be back on a college campus. I thank you for the opportunity to be here at UFM, to be in this auditorium with you, especially considering this is one of the few universities left where freedom and truth are still at the center of student life. As you just heard, I spent some time at such a place, Wyoming Catholic College, and a city of 7,000, Lander, Wyoming, which means it's the 11th largest city in Wyoming, where students discuss Aristotle and Aquinas on horseback on a properly regulated campus, as you heard, where you could not have a cell phone, but you were welcome to possess a gun. It was Wyoming, after all. But few universities in the world can boast a legacy as rich or a mission as heroic as UFM, the preservation of human freedom, human dignity, and human rights, all of which lead to individuals taking their free will and exercising that in a way that helps, helps to build society. Never has this work, never has your work, been more important than it is today. Never will it prove more valuable than in the coming generation. And nowhere can it be more fruitfully done than right here. This may sound inapt at a moment when nations across the region drift toward socialism, statism, and cultural elitism, the so-called pink tide in your region, which really is a red tide toward socialism. Amidst this trend, you may sometimes feel like a lonely vessel tossed about in a turbulent sea. In the last couple of days here in Guatemala, that has been the theme as business leaders, government officials, students, professors have commented to me and my heritage colleagues. But all of this has happened before. That's the good news and the bad news. So take courage. If this so-called pink tides flailing storm and not UFM's steadfast commitment to the truth persists, all is lost. But all is not lost because history, if it does not repeat itself, certainly rhymes. And that effort, the growth of the so-called pink tide, will in fact break for a very simple reason. Battleships like UFM, like the Heritage Foundation, simply don't capsize. It is certainly true and regrettable that liberty, economic, religious, political, is out of fashion today. Your generation knows that all too well. Socialist election victories and subsequent policy shifts in Mexico, Bolivia, Argentina, Honduras, Peru, Colombia, Chile, unfortunately a long list, cannot be dismissed as aberrations or luck. Nor can the monolithic leftism of elite institutions or their power to shape public narratives be discounted. The principles and habits of classical liberalism today do indeed face overwhelming opposition from political, corporate, academic, and cultural elites. But all this is merely to say that the sun still rises in the east and FIFA is still ethically challenged. Freedom is out of fashion among elites today for the same reason it has been out of fashion among elites forever. Of course, private property, voluntary exchange, constitutionalism, equal opportunity, free expression, freedom of religion, the right to life, and the rule of law are threatening to incumbent elites. It is precisely their unearned and exploitative privileges that decentralized and democratized authority preclude. That's why grown-ups laugh when communist and socialist political movements style themselves as revolutionary or populist. The centralization of power by the few and their exploitation of the many is the oldest story in human history. But which part of socialist history is populist? Is it Fidel Castro dying a billionaire while his people starved? Or is it Hugo Chavez turning a thriving nation into a backward kleptocracy? Is it revolutionary that socialist governments and redistributing economic resources somehow always funnel them to politicians' friends? Or that those insiders' children enjoy educational and professional opportunities no one else does? Do you suppose today 
that Uyghurs in China think the Chinese Communist Party is looking out for the little guy? The only high ground Marxism occupies is the mountain of bodies buried beneath its feet. There is a photograph that perfectly captures the tedious, corrupt banality of socialism. Perhaps you've seen it. It's that satellite image of the Korean peninsula at night. South Korea, a free market democracy of 51 million people, is lit up like a fireworks show. North Korea is almost entirely dark. Normally, I use this image to illustrate the comparative wealth and technological progress of a capitalist nation next door to a collectivist one, and it certainly does that. But the most damning indictment of the image is not that 99% of North Korea consigned to darkness, but the tiny little dot that is lit as brightly as the South. That white dot is, of course, Pyongyang, home of Kim Jong-un's Workers' Party regime, the centralization of a few elites. This is the real debate between free enterprise and socialism, not whether a country will get richer or poorer. It's whether the opportunity to improve one's quality of life is a right exercised by all or a privilege exclusive to the few. Friends of the regime, leaders of large public institutions will enjoy those freedoms no matter what political party, system, or, or faction holds power. That's how it is in North Korea, in China, and the Middle East today. That's how it was in Paris under Napoleon, and in Moscow under the czars, Rome under the emperors, Egypt under the pharaohs. The difference between capitalism and socialism is simply this. Whether everyone gets to spend their time and money as they please, or just the elites. Whether all families may feed and house themselves, or just the elites. Whether all children can get an education, or just the elites. Whether all citizens can influence their government, or just the elites. Whether all consumers and businesses can make their way in an open market, or just the elites. Whether all religions can practice their faith, or just the elites. The success of socialism in recent Central and South American elections is not a pink tide, but a black hole. If left unchecked, it will consume not only the region's wealth and freedom, but the people's dignity as well. The most important words written in the history of my country, and to my mind, in any country since the completion of the Bible, are from America's Declaration of Independence. You know these words, but I will quote them here. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those who've studied Enlightenment philosophy or political economics will notice that they did not say life, liberty, and property, but the pursuit of happiness. Here, of course, happiness doesn't mean laughter or cheerfulness, but Aristotle's notion of eudaimonia, flourishing, a deep and abiding satisfaction with life as a whole. Just as important, neither our Declaration of Independence nor our Constitution ever once tries to define what happiness is. And the reason is because America's founders understood, as we understand, that there are as many definitions of happiness as there are people in the world. Guatemala's framers asserted the same truth in your Constitution's preamble. This is an immense truth that should not go overlooked. Here, in your country, the subject and purpose of social order is not merely the individual or the consumer or the citizen, but the far more expansive and correct entity the human person. Guatemala's constitution understands what narrow-minded socialists and materialists do not, that we, the people, are not just actors in an economy or voters in a polity, let alone variables in a planner's spreadsheet 
or a big tech algorithm. We, ourselves, are the authors and protagonists of our own biographies. And each is a unique adventure story. You know that because of your experience at this university, perhaps better than anyone on planet Earth. Our lives are gifts from nature and nature's God. And the purpose of government is to protect our stewardship of that endowment. Our lives belong to ourselves and to our maker and not to anyone else, no matter how privileged, how credentialed, how well-meaning, or how intellectually fashionable they may be. That this approach, the subordination of the servant state to the sovereign citizenry works in the aggregate is beyond dispute. Prior to 1776, no nation ever deferred to its people almost complete control over its political and economic destiny. Up to that moment in history, almost everyone who had ever lived survived on about $1 a day. Almost immediately after the founding of the United States, global per capita GDP began to climb and has not stopped rising 32-fold in the 250 years since. But the economic growth that freedom yields is only a byproduct of its real value, going back to Aristotle, human flourishing. Since the end of the 18th century, life expectancy around the world has nearly doubled. Infant mortality has fallen by more than 90%. Literacy, medical and scientific progress, and the soul-saving work of churches and philanthropies have all been made possible by voluntary contributions from communities that, through capitalism, created surplus wealth for the first time in their histories. This is the story told by one of the Heritage Foundation's flagship reports, the Index of Economic Freedom. Published annually since 1995, the index measures every nation in the world's protection of its citizens' God-given right to strive and to flourish on their own merit and in cooperation with their neighbors. It's not a study of global wealth. Rather, it's a survey of the deeper truths that always and everywhere underlie prosperity. It tracks metrics like property rights, the rule of law, political integrity, fiscal health, the freedom of businesses, consumers, workers, and of trade and banking. Countries that are freer do tend to enjoy growing economies, advantages that compound every year as they have for millennia. But they also enjoy better health, better health care, better schools and more educational opportunities, cleaner environments, more representative and accountable governments, and socialists bemoan the economic inequality that often attends capitalist economies. But compared to what? Nations ranked free or mostly free in the index enjoy median incomes three to seven times higher than their less free counterparts. You see, regimes that stifle economic freedom, on the other hand, tend to be socially, politically, and religiously more oppressive as well. History and recent history shows us that it was East Germany, not West Germany, that had to build a wall to keep its people from escaping. To this day, Cubans risk their lives on makeshift rafts to reach Florida, not the other way around. There are no caravans of migrants crossing international borders to sneak into Iran, Afghanistan, or Venezuela. Throughout history, People who can leave repressive, socialistic societies do. Human beings born with free will tend to move toward freedom. We see this even in the darkest shadows of totalitarian repression. Everywhere people are denied their economic freedom, we find so-called black markets for goods and services that people still want. The only corresponding spontaneous sprouting of economic control in free economies is the lobbying of large corporations to have government dig regulatory moats around their monopolies. Never forget, by the way, 
that corporate cronyism is at least as dangerous to individual liberty as socialism itself. The opposite of anti-business policy is not pro-business policy, but pro-market policy. Nor does capitalism lay bare man's supposed inhumanity towards man. Unchecked capitalism may, given man's fallen human nature, but wherever a moral civil society combined with economic freedom grows, so too do charities, churches, hospitals, and schools. In 1776, the year the United States was founded, and Adam Smith published his Wealth of Nations, there were only a few dozen universities on the planet. The US alone built more than that in the 19th century. Today, there are more than 25,000 institutions of higher learning in the world. That's not because of the benevolence of enlightened politicians and academics. It's because of the new wealth generated by the cooperative competition of responsible investors, innovators, entrepreneurs, and consumers only possible in market economies. Why then, despite economic freedom's unbroken run of historical success and collectivism's invariable descent into oppression and poverty, does the so-called pink tide still rise? One quick response might be that unfettered economic freedom has still not been tried, and that can be the goal that your university and the Heritage Foundation, among others, work towards, not just in your country, but in mine. There are also two additional answers. The first can be found in the old adage, the problem of socialism is socialism. The problem of capitalism is capitalists. Adam Smith himself put the issue plainly in The Wealth of Nations, where he said, people of the same trade seldom meet together even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public. Freedom begets wealth. Wealth can corrupt government. Voters then reject freedom. The only way to prevent the third step in that process is to prevent the second, the process of wealth possibly corrupting government. And the only way to do that is through the kind of humble, honest, principled leadership grounded in the hard lessons of history and in human nature that universities like yours exist to instill. In the American conservative movement, we call this ordered liberty, or the freedom to do not what we want, but what we ought. The second reason is that experience is the school of mankind, and we learn at no other. Socialism's utopian promises of expertly directed equality are as enchanting to young minds today as they were in Paris in 1789, Moscow in 1917, Havana in 1959, and Caracas in 1999. Every new generation, in every society it seems, must learn for itself the harsh lessons of socialism's incompetence, its injustice, it's inhumanity, and dare I say, it's evil. That's why there has never been a better time to be studying or teaching here at UFM. The higher Central and South America's pink tide rises, the more Guatemala will need the lessons of history. The more your generation of Guatemalans will need the knowledge you acquire here. For in economic stagnancy, as in unrepented sin, only the truth can set you free. Democratic capitalism and the rule of law do not rise and fall according to impersonal forces or historical trends. They grow when cultivated and protected by men and women of conviction and courage. In Guatemala in this century, that means you. Some of you will be entrepreneurs yourselves, bold individual thinkers and creators. Some will be political leaders, I hope, defending liberty and the unpredictable path upwards it charts for societies that dare to cleave to it. Some will be judges 
called to mete out justice fairly and equitably between the rich and the poor, the strong and the weak. Most of you, I hope, will be husbands and wives and parents, responsible for sustaining and building local communities of service and cooperation on which the principles of freedom ultimately rest and ultimately get transmitted from your generation to the next. But all of you, all of you, will be keepers of the flame, watchmen on the wall, the vanguard of the only true revolution since Calvary. Socialism is not revolutionary. It's not exciting or romantic. It's not idealistic. It's not even subversive. In fact, it's awfully boring. It's conformism, a broken clock that only by coincidence appears to be right twice a day. It proposes to equalize prosperity by centralizing power and ends up enriching only the anointed few at the expense of everyone else. Socialism is a doctrine of confiscation, not unlike organized crime, except that socialist governments are rarely organized at all. And yet it is ultimately capitalism that is criticized for being volatile, unpredictable, and discomforting. To which we should say, yes, and thank God. Capitalism is not simply a theory of economics, but an affirmation of human nature. Capitalism proposes not to fight human nature, but to harness its immutable incentives to the commonwealth. Thieves take. Corrupted government takes. Capitalism incentives those who would succeed first to give, to serve, and serve not a king or general, but everyone. Elites scoff at the trust liberals put in ordinary people, classical liberals, that is. But history shows the real risk is not trusting them. Anyone who's ever attended a wedding or graduation, seen a child born or a barn raised, Witnessed oppressors overthrown or towns defended from tyrants knows that it is only ordinary people who can be trusted to do extraordinary things. Ordered liberty is not merely the freedom to choose, but the freedom to hope, to envision a better future and then get busy building it. What is capitalism but a competition among ordinary people to devise the best ways to help the most people improve their futures? Socialists insist this is their model, too, and that they achieve it without the cruel exploitations of the marketplace. For centuries, they have promised omelets. For centuries, they've only produced broken eggs, as they are now across Central and South America, as they will, if ever given the chance, here in Guatemala. That is the mission of the men and women at UFM like students and professors at serious universities around the world, to know, to love, and to proclaim the truth in a world imprisoned by lies until the truth is once again called upon to set us free. Keep the freedom to hope in your hearts, and in time, your generation will build the Guatemala that all Guatemalans deserve. And never forget that when, not if, when you accomplish that for your own countrymen, you will have inspired your peers across the world to revitalize their own societies with freedom, the common good, and truth. And remember that when, not if you do that, you will inspire those of us who have the privilege of waking up in the United States of America. May God be with you, and thank you.